changes our lives, Father God. Thank you that it changes our hearts, changes our minds, may they be refreshed, renewed. And I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for your, the power of your spirit, Father God. I thank you that it's life-changing. I thank you that it's life-changing, Father God. And I thank you that we have a changed life today, Father God, in a, in a positive way. And we, we grow closer to you, Father God. I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for your blood. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you that it's washed us all clean. I thank you that it's just... It's, it's just washed us clean of all the mess, all the, all the junk, Father God. And I thank you for that blood. I thank you that it just falls on us this morning. And I thank you that we leave here changed. I thank you that we leave here changed, Father God. I thank you that we leave here with a new heart. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.
never changes, never ceases. Glory to God. Turn around and tell somebody you're so, that I'm so glad God loves me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Then you can be seated. Praise the Lord. It's good to have God loving us. Can you say amen? Amen. All righty. Praise God. A um, couple of announcements. First one is, don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, we're uh, teaching on the, uh, the yeah, we're teaching on the Bible. We're teaching the priorities of life. It's like couldn't get the right word to come up in my head there. Priorities of life, and uh, we're, we're doing a study on that. And so you'll want to be here to be in on that also. And then the last Saturday of this month, we're having a, our vacation Bible school, one-day vacation Bible school right here in the community center over there in that, um, the other where the children's church room is uh, from 10 to 4. Um, we, we had the community center from 9 to 6. We got to set up. We got to break down. Got to do all that stuff. So, uh, and that's six hours with your kids. That's, that's a plenty. Can you say amen? And you know it. Amen. Uh, I mean, you know, you go, when they go to school all day, uh, that's about six hours between get, get lunch out and get recess or whatever. They have about six hours. They're, they're, that's a good day. Well, I don't know if they're ready for them to go. They're just, well, yes, they are. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then on the following Sunday, that very next day, we're having our fifth Sunday fellowship over at Gibson Park. Anybody not know where Gibson Park is? Okay, Gibson Park's on Wendover. Um, between Tarrant Drive and the Palladium, okay? If you're coming from Greensboro, it'll be on the left. If you're coming from High Point, it'll be on the right. And there's an old-fashioned, uh, like, musket on the sign, okay? It's, it's, it's a wood-carved sign, and it's got a musket on it. Um, so Gibson Park, you turn it in there, and filter number one, all right? And I'll uh, be there for, that, for the day on that Sunday. And so we're going to have a sign-up sheet. Um, he just sent it to me for the review. Okay. I will look at it and review it. But we're, we're going to, the church is going to provide the burgers and the dogs. Okay. And then you're going to provide the buns, the ice, the cheese, the um, baked beans, the potato salad, the whatever else, uh, you know, desserts, drinks. We'll buy the meat. You buy the stuff. And if you don't show with your dog buns, there are going to be some upset folks. We don't have all them dogs and nothing to put them in. Low-carb burgers and dogs, that's right. No, those are no-carb. I mean, you got low-carb and then no-carb. Those are no-carb. So anyway, that, so we're going to have Vacation Bible School on the Saturday, Fifth Sunday Fellowship on the Sunday, and you say, why are we doing Eastern Carolina Barbecue? That's a lot of work. You know, right here in the middle of the summer, I, I, I was thinking about trying to do it in the summer, but then I, I realized that's a lot of outdoor heat to try to do that in the middle of the summer. You know, well, the restaurants do it. Yeah, they get paid to do it uh, every day. <clears throat> and I want you to know, they cook the barbecue over the pork overnight and make barbecue. Those pigs are coming up at 5 a.m. Okay, they got put on at 11 or 9 the night before. They're coming up at, at 5 a.m. And by 9, it's all chopped up and ready to roll. Okay, so we would be doing it right in the middle of the day. Yeah, all right. Praise the Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I think that is all of our announcements. Is that the only two announcements that we have up there? Is Fifth Sunday Fellowship? All right. Praise God. So be here for all of those events. All right. Um, at this time, it's time to receive our Sunday morning tithe and offering. If you need an offering envelope, Brother Joe is in the aisle. If you send electronically through Square, Square Cash, you can go ahead and send that on up, and we'll be glad to receive that. You will, when you watch the, uh, if you watch or even on your screen, you should be seeing the church logo and stuff. We, uh, there's a new feature we can use on our Mevo. So if you, if you look at your uh, screen on your, uh, of the stream, you'll see our church logo and, and name and stuff out there. You'll get to see all that. Praise God. So um, hallelujah. So you're all ready to give. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the tithe and for the offering that's brought into the storehouse of God. Thank you that the people are blessed in accordance with your word and that the, the tither and the giver receives heaven's windows open unto them and blessings they cannot have room enough to receive or don't have room enough to receive coming on them in the mighty name of Jesus. Go ahead, usher, and receive that into the kingdom of God. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Once we receive that, the children will go to Children's Church. Hallelujah. We are... 
going to receive a special offering next week towards Vacation Bible School. We do, not only do we have to rent the facility for the whole day, which is um, um, nine hours, we have it. Uh, during the week, uh, drain the battery. <laughs> Even though it's not being used, it'll do it. You know, okay. Praise the Lord. All righty. What was I saying before that happened? Oh, Children's Church Preschool, you guys are dismissed to go to your class at this time. And I'm sorry I put them on the spot. That's my fault. I should have made sure it was off. Um, also, that that's this button on that pack is easy to accidentally turn on. So if we take it off, somebody could pick it up and hit that, just brush that little button. It's not a flip switch, which is easier to keep up with. Um, you could actually hit it and not know it and turn it on. So it's, it's uh, finicky. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All righty. Praise God. How many love Jesus? Amen. We're, we uh, finished last week. We finished our sermon and we're, uh, our series on, um, you know, what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. We're now going to begin uh, going into, um, just, let me, there we go. Uh, teaching on the love of God, okay? And we're going to get into some things about what love is. We are actually going to get into what love isn't, all right? Oftentimes, we, we start teaching on the love of God. Everybody wants to, you know, we, we love to teach on the stuff that everybody wants to hear, okay? You know, uh, God loves us, you know, and, and um, are we on now? Praise the Lord. All righty. Praise God. Isn't that just lovely? Hallelujah. It's amazing what batteries will do for a, a, a lapel mic. Hallelujah. Um. But we we get these narratives in our in our churches and in our in our uh, teachings and so forth and, and like uh, you'll get an evangelist now the evangelist will go out and preach the love of God he's not going to preach some of the things you teach to the church you can't teach the sinner to live right they're unsaved they can't live right they don't have the power to live right. Okay? Even if they're not doing it, they're thinking it. Okay? Um, so, you, so the message to the world is God loves you, you know, uh, repent. And I was repent of your sin. Come to God. He'll clean you up. Come like you are. You don't have to get right before you can come to him. You don't have to get cleaned up to come to him. You come, you come dirty. He cleans you up. But there are things about the love of God to the church that we don't teach that we should teach. Amen. And I'm just going to do an opening dialogue here. Have a little fireside chat without the fire today. Don't want it, do you? Yeah, Holy Ghost fire, that's right. Um, there are things that we don't want to teach in the church because it's not popular. It doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't make our churches bigger in a lot of cases because everybody wants to run off to the one that they, you know. We, we do live, we do live in an era um, where men are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They have itching ears. They're heaping unto themselves teachers. They want to be taught everything that makes them feel good and never be challenged on what makes them feel bad. And there are going to be times you need to deal with stuff in your life that is displeasing to God and address it and fix it. Now, so we, I'm going to give you two. We're going to take two scriptures this morning and then we'll just kind of jump in. On this, let's go to John chapter 3. And then we're going to Revelation. What I'm going to, I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the two different dichotomies here we're talking about. And then we're going to go from there. All right. John chapter 3, one of the most, if not the most famous or popular scripture in all of Christendom. Um, praise the Lord. John chapter 3. We'll start in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? 
and knowest not these things. Now, we know Nicodemus had come to Jesus and said, Thou art a teacher come from God. No man does the miracles which you do except God be with him. And Jesus said, Except the man be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, How can a man enter in a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus said, That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. And then Nicodemus says, How can these things be? And Jesus says, <clears throat> Are you a teacher or a master of Israel and know not these things? Okay. And uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, you'd believe not. How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now let me say something. Well, let's read the next one. He that believeth on him that is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the Son, of, of, of the only begotten the Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. Now, Yeah. Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, see, we'll run off to do that. See, that, no, if you ever feel condemnation, it's not Jesus. Now, that, this, take the context of what he said. He came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In other words, he did not come to destroy, to, to cast into hell, to, 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 to uh, deliver man into judgment. He came to redeem them. His mission was not to come and judge them. Oh. May wanna maybe wanna um mute the TV. Wow. When Jesus came into the earth, he wasn't coming to condemn men to their sin. Okay? He came that they might be saved. The message to the sinner is, you know, God, Jesus came to save you. If you now, Jesus went on and said, but if they don't believe, they're damned. Are y'all here? You're going home. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we, we can't take some of these narratives to such an extreme that, you know, you can't ever mention sin. We, we are, Jesus talked about sin. He said people who remain in darkness are condemned. Hello? And they run from the light. He dealt, he dealt with sin. We can't walk around talking about We don't ever deal with sin because that makes people feel bad. I'm sorry Jesus did. Hello. Now I'm going. I'm going to be doing a deeper study. Um, I just got a sense in my spirit. You know, people take the word repent and say, "Well, it just means to change your mind." Well, that is a simple and very simplistic interpretation. And oftentimes, they'll just go find what the Greek word meant in secular Greek and won't do a deeper study on it. It it does carry a connotation of changing one's mind, but it's not simply that you become a Christian. Repent. You turn. And go in a different direction. No, oh, I'm now going. I now love Jesus. That's the change of mind I got. Well, there's more to it. There's a turning away, and a turning unto. That's that. All right. So anyway, Jesus said, "I came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved." But he that believeth on me is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned. Now here he is talking about going to hell. He is talking about that the Son of Man came into the earth. God loved the world so much. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God for humanity was in their lost state. 
He sacrificed his son to redeem them. He wasn't... He had every right to condemn and to judge them, but he sent Jesus to bring, to bring reconciliation to those who would believe. His love was so great that even though they, they, all humanity deserved the judgment, all humanity deserved hell, all humanity deserved uh, every bit of condemnation, Jesus came to deliver us. That is the context in which this is stated. It is not that after you become a Christian, you can just go out and do anything you want to, and if somebody says you shouldn't do that, that's condemnation. That's condemnation. I'm not under condemnation. You, you, you simply show your immaturity in the study of Scripture when you say that. Well, Paul, I mean, you know, that where Paul wrote in Romans, that chapter 8 says, There is therefore no, no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And what goes on says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's not in the original Greek. That's not in the original Greek. It's in verse 4 in the original Greek. I don't care what manuscript you use. Minuscules, manuscules. Uh, um, if you use the Septuagint, if you use the Vul uh, Latin Vulgate, you, whichever, whatever you use, it's in verse 4. And it's a continued thought. Okay? They just, they just they say, they, it's not there. It's not in the original Greek. The context is, it's just like the Scripture over in Ephesians chapter 2, which we will confess. You know, um, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he quickened us in the Greek, it's not for now. Okay? He quickened us, made us alive together. It's not up in that earlier verse. But the context, okay? Hello? Now, it's not there in the, in the, men, in the men's schools, in the, in, in the minor men's majors it is. With the King James majors, it's in the, ma it's in the, ma it's in the major uh, uh, Greek text. All right? So the context is that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on says something, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. Now, I know you, you and, and I don't bother, but I don't even argue on Facebook. I just, I stop. I don't do it. Just, I'm fed up when I'm on Facebook with people, you know, and, they, and they're just, you know, and I'm going to tell you that the whole bunch that's so tolerant of, of sin and are not tolerant if anybody disagrees with them. You do them and you'll feel the pure, absolute, demonic wrath of hell come against you for disagreeing with them. Okay, they'll unfriend you. They'll, they'll, I mean, they'll blast you. They'll do all kinds of stuff. I got, to, I, I, I'm challenging. I want to challenge you. If you want that type, check your spirit. I, I, I'm under grace. I don't have any. I, I don't have any condemnation. Oh, no. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten that who believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, here it is. God's love presented the answer. You still have to receive it. Because Jesus said those that don't believe suffer condemnation. Those that do, don't. Amen. Amen. Now, let's run over real quick to Revelation. I, uh, we'll come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I have some things, but I'm letting the Lord put the meat on the bone. Hallelujah. We look in, in, in Revelation chapter um, 1, verse 7. I felt that as, fell as, he, as he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And, and the king of hell, write these things that are seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars of the angels are messengers of the seven churches. Mostly, most people believe that figuratively you're talking about pastors, the local shepherds, the churches. Candlesticks, life says, please, you know, it's, it's the anointing and the light of those churches. Uh, angels are messengers. The Greek says messengers. And, and, and the word translated angels can be translated messenger. Okay, um, of the churches, the seven churches thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, who's he writing this letter? 
What did Jesus appear to John and say to him? He came and he said, and he had a whole vision. This thing was, you know, he talks about the seven churches. He saw a vision. He saw Jesus with seven candlesticks. He saw seven angels. And Jesus reveals him the, figure, the figurativeness of that. The, the angels are the messengers, the pastors. The candlesticks are the churches. So is it, well, who is Jesus addressing in this vision? The church. Seven different churches. It was, it was, I'm not of Laodicea, the seven churches um, there on a postal route. Okay? There was a, a route, and it was seven churches on this route that Jesus addressed. Now, figuratively, we get types of churches of this. They were literally seven churches. Okay? And Jesus writes to them and says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, you're under grace, I have nothing else to say. Unto the church of such and such. Now, you hear some people teach, and that's what they say. All you got to know is you're under grace, that's it. It doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter anything, because it's already taken care of. You're going to be blessed no matter what. You're going to be saved no matter what. You're going to live in the blessings, the fullness of the blessings of God no matter what. That's just not Bible. Now, I know that there may be people watching who don't, who don't agree with me that your blood's boiling right now. Get back under grace. <laughs> I'm, I am being a smart aleck. I'm purposely doing that. Because we have to understand, Jesus said unto the church of, the, of, of Ephesus, right, unto the angel or the messenger or the pastor of the church of Ephesus, right, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, who's walking in the midst of the churches? The head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What does that mean when he walks in the midst? He's the head. We are yielded, we are submitted, we do his will, we do his bidding, we do him and everything that we say or we do, we do it in, re in, in deference to him and his desire. Now, this is, this is, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst bear, uh, canst not bear them which are and how thou shalt try them that are not apostles, that say they're apostles and that are not, found them to be liars, and has, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, doesn't matter what else you've done because you're under grace. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because I left thy first love. See, when we can't address things in the church because it's not love, and that's, that's really a false narrative on love. And I'll prove it to you why he's writing to the churches, that, to the churches okay, here. I'll prove it to you, that love is not a simple sloppy agape smear of salve on them, let you do whatever you want to do. Love is strong. See, parents, we got, we got this, this generation of parenting, I love my children, I don't want to break their spirit. Well, you better put some on their backside when they're little so, that, you know, I don't want to break their spirit. That's why you end up with the monster you get at, at 18 years old, that you can't control and can't say anything to. You can't ever tell them no. Okay? You can't tell the little boy he can't dress up like a little girl because that might hurt his feelings. He feels like a girl. Dear Lord. I better stop. Because you've blessed your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. And... Re repent and do the first works or el listen or else now wait a second we are told in a lot of people's narrative that the love of God and the grace of God that there's no consequences to anything we do because we're under the grace of God we got people teaching that selling books selling tapes people are packing into churches that teach this way because it just makes them feel so good. Well, he says, repent from where you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else. Now, that sounds like there's going to be something coming that you don't like. 
or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Well, you, when, you, when you get born again, you'll never have to repent again. I've heard people say it. Uh, could you please notify Jesus of your revelation? Because he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. Because he's telling the church at Ephesus they got to repent or else something's going to happen unless they repent. Hello? See, these, these are the things. I, listen, you, I know you turn on television, you turn on uh, the, the Christian television, you get these people on there. And listen, you know, I, I've been to the Christian television station locally. I've been in there, and they market it just like the, the world does. I've had them tell you, the, the pastors that come and sit in there, I've had them look at you and say, you're eye candy. You're just here to fill up the back of the platform. Heard them say it with my mouth, on their own mouth. And the only thing that kept me from walking out of there right then was I didn't want, I didn't want to bring a reproach on something. I never went back after that. I'm not going to do that. You're not bringing me in here and set me on the platform with window dressing. Hello? Thank you, Jesus. But he says here that they have to repent. And he goes on to talk about he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And the interesting thing was the Nicolaitans were ones who were, um, I, I would just get into them and set up churches on another time. I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay? Um, verse 16. Repent or else, talking to another church, okay? Uh, he's talking here to the, to, the, to, the, to the church of Smyrna. He comes down here and tells him in verse 16, Repent or else I will come quickly and fight against them with the sword of thy mouth, of my mouth, okay? He that hears the ears that hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Going over to chapter 3, um, Verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If thou therefore shalt not watch, I will come to, uh, on thee as a thief, and thou wilt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Um, glory, my goodness. Amen. Are you here? Now let's, let's, look, let's go down here. He gets over here down into Laodicea in verse 14. And the church of the angel, and to the angel of the pastor of the church of Laodicea, write, these things saith the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither come cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He ain't talking to the sinners. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with thy goods, have, have need of nothing, and knowest not thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, <clears throat> I counsel thee to buy of me gold, try in the tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that, that, uh, and that the, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes when I say that thou mayest see. Listen to verse 19. Look at me. Listen to it. Then you can look at it. Read it. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Where's my amen corner? I need a little synthesizer thing that Dick and Nathan where you get like extra voices when you say something. Hold it. As many as I love, stop. Now, if you've heard a lot of narrative on the love of God, and there's no rebuking or no chastening in it. But Jesus said, Jesus said to the church, at Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now, he's not trying to hurt them. He's trying to bring them back on course. He's not, he doesn't want them in hell. Are you here? But he, so the rebuke and the chastening is to bring you back on course. And he says, goes on and says, be zealous, therefore, and Repent. 
how people can come up with this thing that, you know, because we're under God's love, we're under God's grace, we never have to repent. I don't get it. I honestly don't get it. They even came out, they had a bunch of guys run around a couple of years ago saying that they found some, some new Greek scholars have found that 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is not actually in the Greek, and so they took it out of their Bible, printed Bibles without it. Why? Because it didn't fit their narrative. And they started getting on Facebook. Well, actually, in the Greek, it's not in the Greek. <laughs> okay, so Scripture disagrees with you. It's not there in the Greek. It's amazing how many things weren't in the Greek when they started talking. We found out that's not in the Greek. Why? Because it didn't fit a narrative. It didn't fit a subject matter. And really what was happening, the same thing that Jude said, they, 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 they crept in and turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, licentiousness. Greek actually means wantonness. They turned the grace of God to that. So, so the grace of God, the love of God, see, because now let me say this, most people equate the grace and love of God on, on, on the same footing. Because of his love, we're under his grace. And that grace functions in us because he loves us, no matter what. But the truth of the matter is that the grace of God is an empowerment to live, to, to uh, exist in the way that God desires you to do it, but it's still a grace empowerment to do. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves for uh, um, James says, James says in chapter 1, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. What? The hearer was a, does what? Deceives his own self. So the grace of God, you know, which we will they'll equate it with the love of God and say they're interchangeable basically is because of his love. I can, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. That's not the love of God. As a matter of fact, if you love God, you're going to want to tithe. You're going to want to give if you love God. You're not going to look for ways not to and rejoice over the fact that you don't have to. Now, as New Testament believers, we shouldn't be doing anything out of a legalistic mindset. I get that side of it. In other words, I don't tithe because it's legally bound. I'm legally bound to do it. I tithe because God's Word teaches it, and I love God, and I want to obey God because I love Him. I want to honor Him with everything that I do. I want to honor Him. See, when you love for God, you're not going around talking about, yeah, okay, I don't have to tithe, but I do because I love Him. He wants me to, and I want to because He wants me to. Okay, I can, I can handle that. But you go out on tithe, I don't have to give, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to submit, I don't have to obey, da 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 And all you're doing is rejoicing, which you don't have to do because you're under grace. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you're truly under grace and you're living out of the grace of God, you're tithing, you're giving, you're, uh, you're submitting, you're obeying, you're doing because you want to. You've been empowered to do it out of your heart, not out of legalism. Amen. God loves you. Yes, God loves you. Let me say this. God loves you if you go to hell. Now, the Bible teaches there's a, there's a, there's a, a period of crying in heaven. Tears be wiped away. I personally kind of take the, the, the view is to wipe away the tears of God himself because people went to hell and didn't receive Jesus. He'll be saddened by those who go to hell for eternity because they rejected his his. His offer, and the and the consequences are eternal. Okay, but look here, back again, verse nineteen. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be ze zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in His throne. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So here we are. The love of God is not God loves you no matter what you're doing, and it doesn't matter what you do. He's going to love you. Now, let me say this. He does love you no matter what you do. Let me stop there. 
the implication for people is he loves you, therefore nothing bad is going to happen. There won't be any condemnation. There won't be any judgment. There won't be any consequences for you doing that because he's going to make sure nothing happens to you because he loves you no matter what you're doing. That's the implication. That's what they imply. How do you know that's what they imply? Because that's what the people coming away from hearing it are saying. Now, you can't control everybody and make sure everybody's got it together. But when the vast majority of the narrative, everybody's saying the same thing about it, then something's not being conveyed properly. Now, we had a lot of people running around on, um, on prosperity. I, I, I know, I know, I know. But see, I, this is an introduction. Okay? I had a lot of people running around on prosperity, and, and people were teaching stuff, and, and the, preacher, the preacher say, well, I didn't teach it that way. Yeah, but you're not conveying it. You're, you're careful not to say anything that would balance it because they won't give. Well, I don't believe that. I heard one preacher who preached you know, some of this, this, this grace this way um, privately say, he did, well, he didn't practice that himself. But because of where the church is located, he preaches that because that's the culture. You know, they're in such condemnation from, you know, uh, uh, Catholicism and tradition and stuff that he has to preach this other extreme to get them out of it. The problem is you're taking that message all over the world. You're going into church America and coming to stadiums and filling up stadiums and preaching that same message and charging people to come hear it, to fill up the stadium and not balancing the message. Can't have it both ways. Can't have that. I don't. I don't practice it, but I preach it. Oh, anyway, where was I before I got off on that? Somebody got got to help me out here. So you know, so we have these we have these these extremes. We have um, you know the love of God is you know God. And and let me say something to the sinner. When we go to the sinner, you don't tell them to to get everything straight. You just say repent. For the kingdom of heaven is the hand. Jesus came and died for you. Confess him as Lord, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The message to the world is not the message to the church. And it, the, the message, the, the, the Word of God doesn't change when it's addressed to the church, but there's a lot about the Word of God that's not applicable to the lost. An evangelistic message is not, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> um, stop drinking and stop fornicating. That's not the message to the world. They're sinners. Sinners sin. But to the church, stop. No, you changed the message. You know? And they use Galatians that you began in the spirit, you now made perfect by the flesh. You know? Um, and that's that's a, again taking a verse out of a contextual setting and manipulating it into your narrative to make your point valid, and it's invalid. Paul wrote that because they were going back to the law to stay righteous or become righteous or to be righteous. Faith in Christ, but you still got to be circumcised. You still can't walk so far. You can't, you know. No, my salvation is not completed or made better if I upheld the law. That's what he was talking about. There were, the Judaizers were coming trying to get them to go back under the law. Okay, you can believe on Jesus, but you still got to do the law. Now, they'll say that teaching people to live right is putting them under the law. No. That's walking worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And if you think that sounds like a scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. That's why it sounds like a scripture. Because Paul took the first three chapters of Ephesians and told us who we were, what we had, what belongs to us in Christ, our position in Christ. And he took chapters 4, 5, and 6 and told us how we're supposed to live it. And he, and he, he heads off or begins the, 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 second, the division of the book in the last half with, Wherefore, walk ye worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. And he spends the next three chapters telling you how to live. Amen. See? So, the, the, the narrative of the love of God is, you know, sloppy agape, you can just do whatever you want to do. When I go to a sinner, I don't start telling them that they need to stop sinning this, they need to stop doing that, they need to stop running around their life. You need to get saved. Because you've got a carnal nature. Your nature needs to be changed. Now, after you get saved and you come out and you're running around, you need to stop running around your wife. You're a Christian. 
You need to live out of the empowerment on the inside. You stop living that way. Stop living that way. Oh, you're making you're you're perfecting them in the flesh. No, they're supposed to let that work, the sin them work, and cause them not to do those things. All right. Okay. So let's go to First Corinthians chapter thirteen. We we just kind of these are, I'm just kind of laying things out here. We're going to pick up on themes here, and we're going to go through them over the next uh, services. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read this, but, I, you know, it's, it's a short chapter. <clears throat> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. Now, the Greek word translated charity here is agape. Translate love in other places in the New Testament, but in this particular case, they use charity. Um, one reason is the, the, um, that word had become... Uh, watered down in its meaning, and they were trying to, the, the writers were trying, trying to emphasize the giving and non rewardedness of loving. In other words, not doing to get, not doing for a specific reward, but doing it because you love people. So he says here, so I'm going to read it as love, okay, because it is in the Greek of Sagape, it's love. Um, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and <clears throat> have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love vaunteth, uh, envies not. Love vaunteth not or puffs itself up. It's not, uh, it's not puffed up. Uh, doth not behave itself unseemly seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, <coughs> bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Um, Amplified Bible says, um, believes all things, ever ready to believe the best of every, ever ready to believe the best of every person. If a guy's got a gun, you're going to pull the trigger, uh, it doesn't believe he, he does, he's not going to. You're ready to believe the best of every person. But if they're going if they just shot your wife, they're gonna shoot you. Yeah. I mean, you know. No, but it want in other words, his first reaction is not negative or, 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 or condemning or judgmental. Okay? Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail or fade away, really. Not not fail. They won't fail. It's true prophecy won't fail. Prophecy won't be needed. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether you know, you're not going to need. Listen, when you get to heaven, you're not going to need speaking in tongues. Okay. They shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And get to knowledge. It's not talking about knowledge. You're going to have knowledge in heaven. All right. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, it's come. Let me just mark it there. Put a circle around it. Put stars beside it. Write out in your Bible somewhere. This is not a reference to the canonicity of Scripture. Somebody just made that up and sold it to the church, and they all believe it. This is not the canonicity of Scripture. How do you know? Because he went on and said, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. Now, they use that to say all the gifts of the Spirit are gone. Yet, they'll turn right around and teach that prophecy is inspired preaching. But that's been done away with. So there's no such thing as inspired preaching anymore. Is there? If it's all been done away with, because we have the canon of Scripture, there's no such thing as inspired preaching. See, you can't have it both ways. You can't explain it away. You no, know, knowledge is our universities. Tongues are the linguistics. You know, healings are our hospitals. You know, the chapter 12 where it talks about all the gifts of the Spirit. You can get down that hole so deep you ain't going to get out. John Osteen did it one time. He's preaching. He's preaching on the gifts of the Spirit and talking about how none of them were for the church today. He said he got about halfway down that list, and he's kind of going along, explaining away everything about the gifts of the Spirit, no supernatural, nothing. So he just finally stopped in the middle of his sermon. You know, it was, it, was Southern, it, was, it, was, it was Lakewood Southern Baptist Church. Now, he said this. I'm not making this up. John Osteen said this, Joel's dad. He said, one day a tornado came by, blew the word Southern Baptist off. It just said Lakewood Church. We took it as a sign from God and left it that way. 
But he held his papers with, I'm, I'm not sure if he held it up until his death. He held it way, way, way after he got filled with the Holy Ghost, became a charismatic preacher, full gospel businessman. He didn't ever turn his papers in with the Southern Baptists. He maintained them. And because uh, he'd been with them, he, you know, listen, he loved, he loved what, they, what they did for God. They loved what they did for the world missions. He was, he's, you know, he believed in what they did. He wasn't against them. Okay? Um, where was it? Uh, yeah. So he was preaching that and got there, got right by here in the middle of it. And he, he, he said, and John, uh, I, was, I, heard, I heard this one sermon, I heard him teaching it. He said, I, I said, I just stopped. I said, people, forget about everything I've said today. I don't have a clue about what I'm talking about. Go home. I'll see you next Sunday. And walked off the platform. Because he got out there and figured out he didn't know what he was talking about. Okay? Sometimes we need to do that. All right. But then when that which is appropriate has come is not the canon Nazi of Scripture. We know from 1 John that when he shall appear, we shall be as he is. We'll see him as he is. That is it. <coughs> that is the perfection. Delivered from the, the mortal body, the corruptible body, into an immortal, immortal glorified body. That is perfection. And we will, And he goes on and says, uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. But now, now this is Paul who was called into a third heaven, heard that things unlawful to be uttered. I think Paul has reached manhood at this point. But he says this, and Paul sees it. Paul was not allowed to just come back and, and, and say everything he saw. He had to spend the rest of his ministry, the rest of his life, writing out the revelation, which is referred to by many theologians or most theologians as the Pauline revelation of who we are, what we have, what we possess in Christ, the in him reality. And all of his letters, Paul takes all of the writings over those years to write out and bring the revelation that he saw in that third heaven. He saw the new creation. He saw the born-again man. He saw the spirit of man as he truly is. And he says, now we see through a glass darkly. But then he goes on and says this, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then, <coughs> but then shall I know even also as I am known. Let me ask you all something. How many have got a Bible? How many are born again? Do you know God exactly the way he knows you? Why? Because then it hadn't come. Then it can't be something like the guys got together at a council in such and such A.D. and voted on it and said, this is canon. And on that moment, at that moment, all the gifts of the Spirit ceased. All the manifestations of the Spirit ceased. All the power of God ceased. We now have the Scripture. We've grown up. We're mature. We don't need those things anymore. How silly we can be. And how silly we can be to sit in the congregation and accept that, not, not challenge that. Hello. Hello. And now by the faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, let's come back over here. And then verse 14 starts out, follow after love <coughs> and desire spiritual gifts, gifts that rather that you may prophesy. He spends all chapter 14 talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? He spends the whole chapter talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 13 Paul wasn't right along talking about the gifts of the Spirit and, and, and chapter, through chapter 12 and jumps over to chapter 14 and talks about the gifts of the Spirit. <coughs> and somehow or another, chapter 13 got stuck in there. It is within the context of what he's writing. And one of the things that we need to, you need to understand about the writing of the, the letters to the church at Corinth is this. The church at Corinth loved to have manifestations of the Spirit, but they were as carnal as, as a dog and a, and a bone. 
If you can have the best dog on the planet, you get him a bone, he'll, he'll fight you for it. Hello? You can spank your dog for getting in the garbage, and he'll go right back in it five seconds later if you're not watching. And you'll come running over there, and they'll run. And if you walk away, they'll come back. The Corinthian church was carnal. They came behind in no gift, but they were carnal. And Paul, they come to church and get drunk. He rebuked them for that. Hello. They, uh, they would all try to out-prophesy out one another. He rebuked them for that. They try to out-gift one another. He got rebuked for that. Hello. And so Paul, in writing about the gifts of the Spirit, right here in the middle of it, drops in this dissertation on love. Now, it is not simply a general treatise on love that we can just take out by itself and go, okay, love, 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 let's have love. It is specifically or, uh, uh, um, directed at the conduct of believers in relationship to the church and to others and how they do their Christian walk particularly in reference to the working and flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Because if you have not love, you're a clanging and tinkling symbol. Amen? You can prophesy to the hair on everybody in the building standing up on end and goosebumps and run all over them, and you can speak in tongues and you can let you all kinds of miracles, but if you have not love, if the motive and the operation of what's going on is not love. It's unsound. So here, Paul drops into the middle of the, the, the gifts operating in the church and puts a parameter on them. <coughs> this isn't some mistake. He just kind of, why in the world Paul just all of a sudden start about walking in love? Because in order to be a spiritual person, to tr be truly spiritual, then the love of God has to be your motivation in everything you do. It's not so that you can look like you, you're the, the prophesying person in the church. I had a word from the Lord tonight, and the more we, the church came in glued after I gave it. What's your motivation? Being noticed. You want everybody to think you're spiritual. I'm available to God, not because I want people to think I'm great. I'm available to God because I love them. And if God uses me to bring something into their life that will help them, then glory to God. I'm just the vessel. I'm just the conduit. I'm nothing. But I love them. I'm, will, I'm willing to put myself out to be available to be judged or mocked or whatever in order to help bless them if, if that's what God wants to do because I love them. So Paul puts this in here to temper the attitudes, the carnalness, the pride of this church. To be, to, to be careful to make sure your motivation for anything you do in your walk with God, for God, is love. So this is a reference to our attitude about our walk with the Lord. Why we do what we do. More so than just a descriptive of love. Hello. And most sermons preach on it, talk about it. it just, they just kind of jump in here 13, take 13 out, and go preach on the, how love is described. But there's a reason it's here and not somewhere else. There's a reason that Paul wrote it here and John didn't write it in his. <coughs> the Holy Spirit anointed Paul and prompted Paul to write it here. John could have wrote this. He's called the apostle of love. The themes of 1 John are for God is light, God is life, God is love. But God had Paul, by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, had Paul write this, 
right in the middle of instruction on how the, spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are operating in the church. And just jumps right in the middle and says, okay, wait a second now. Let's not get carried away with prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, gifts of healings, working of miracles, discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, special faith, without first understanding that everything we do has to be launched from the platform of the love of God in our life. That that love is the governing factor of why we do what we do. The temperance that the love of God will bring to the deliverer is astounding. One thing it'll do, it'll keep pride out of your life. You won't be going around after church going, how great I am, how great I am. Because you gave a word. So did the donkey. Donkey. Hello? Are you here? So you're in the same class as a donkey. Or a chicken. Chicken crow twice, remember? Come on now. Don't get the big head. I, I look, I know in immaturity people do stuff and they think, you know, and that's why we need to teach. The, the, lo the love of God is a tempering factor of what we do. We don't get puffed up. We, are, we, we, we believe the best of everybody, are ready to believe the best of everybody. That means we don't withhold something from them because we think they don't deserve it. Boy, God couldn't be saying that to them. Whoa, 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 whoa. She loves everybody to believe. God may have a word for somebody. You're thinking, my God, there's no way in the world that could be for them. I know what they did yesterday. Love's not tempering your use in the gifts of the Spirit. Hello? Because God may have a word for them because he sees what. I have prayed for thee, Peter, when thou art converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. He knew what he was going to do. And yet, he told them to feed my sheep. And he told them all kinds of stuff. You know, after you're converted. I, I, you're going to deny me twice. That's all right. I know you will. Thrice. Before the clock, clock closed twice. I know you're going to, but I prayed for you. And after you're converted, you're going to strengthen the brethren. See, love even past the failure. But when you're when you're not walking in the love of God, you got power, the power. I got word from the God. I, I prophesy over the people. I give them a word. That's probably what's going on. You're giving them a word. Throwing a little, little a few of my sons and thou's in there, and it sounds like it's from heaven. God could have a word for somebody in the building, and you're, going, you're looking at them going, my God, they missed it. Oh, they missed it. It, could, it couldn't be them. If they had listened to you, the person wouldn't have got it. And it was the thing that turned their life around. The Lord loved them enough to speak to them supernaturally that way. And they, they just were overwhelmed by it. And it just did something in them and turned them around. But, you're, but see, if you've been if you if you've been in charge of that one, if you'd had got that word come to you, you would have held it back because you know they couldn't have received, it couldn't be for them. You'd have gone around the room looking for the person it was for. That can't be for them. Who was that for? Oh yeah, I know someone said that's got to be for them. Now the love of God believes the, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. It has hope in everything. So <clears throat> when we began to see that we are conducting ourselves, we're flowing against the Spirit, the things we're doing are now constrained by the love of God. This is why this is here. Not just so we can preach on the, on the subject on what the love of God is, the characteristics of the love, because this is specifically aimed at the way we function in the church. Not just a list of what it is. That's why it's here. That's why it's right where it is. 
It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't even a rabbit trail, so to speak. Because, you know, we, well, that's what I would think. I would think he was going off on a rabbit trail. I think I'd be even in the past preached it that way. Yeah, Paul went off on a rabbit trail on the, on the love of God that came back. No. This was deliberately orchestrated by the Holy Spirit in place right here for the purpose of understanding that with power, with the supernatural, we must be governed by God's love and how we operate and walk in it. Amen. And that does, well, one thing it does, it brings a safety to our life that we won't misuse something for any, any reason on this planet. Everybody can miss it. If you're missing it because you're arrogant, that's another thing. You're not even missing it. You're going the way of Balaam. You're doing it for your own reward and your own gain. Hello. So we're going to stop right there and let you think about this for a week. Amen. Hallelujah. The love of God. So the love of God is not a, um, a, a manifestation of grace to do whatever you want to do. The love of God does rebuke Hello? and chasten. The love of God does demand repentance. And the love of God is how we are. Now, listen, we're, we're going to talk about the love of God and how God loves us and, you know, what more, you know, all that. We're going to get into all this. But I just want to throw some stuff out there at you. Get the spiritual WD-40 out. Put it on those rusty gears. Let y'all start doing some thinking. Amen? Stand up. Father, we thank you for this time together. We bless the people. We thank you that you do love them. And that the love of God causes us and constrains us and works in us. And the motive behind our heart is to honor you and to bless you and to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So until next time, we, lo we love you, we bless you, and we say remember that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God bless you until next time.